Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to give it a minute as everybody starts to join us here. We are just about ready to get started. I'm gonna let a few more people come in. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second of our two night events. Um, <laughs> don't share just yet. <laughs> we are talking tonight about our research panel, uh, looking obviously first at research during COVID and um, having a discussion on that. Our first panel is gonna be COVID-19's impact on the criminal justice system. And we'll get that group going first. We wanted to first give Mark a chance. Mark is the president of the Western Association of Criminal Justice and um, wanted to give him a chance to come in and say some words. So Mark. Hi uh, everyone, my name is Mark Rufinengo and I am the president of the Western Association of Criminal Justice. I'd like to welcome you all to the second night of this conference. And thank you to Taryn and Jennifer and Marianne um, for doing all of the work on this. Um, I would like to welcome those of you who are not in the WACJ region to our event. And of course, invite you as well to our conference in Spokane in 2021. Hopefully nothing gets in the way of that. Although, um, that seems to be going around. We have a good time. Um, we, have, we have fun. We have serious business. Um, we have an exciting Wack Shea trivia, uh, trivia competition as well uh, that can get pretty heated. And uh, of course, the research is excellent as well. So I would just like to say thank you all for being here. And I will turn it back over to Taryn. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, as I said, I actually, I don't, I don't know what I've said so far. <laughs> I'm Dr. Taryn Vanderpile from Western Oregon University in the Criminal Justice Sciences Division. I'm the second vice president of uh, Western Association of Criminal Justice, or what we lovingly call WACJ. And I second Mark in um, hoping you will, will join us as an organization and hopefully someday again soon join us in person. Um, Mark, I'm gonna take you off the screen here. No offense. Okay, um, before we get it started on our first presentation, I just wanna go over a couple logistics things. Presenters, uh, while if, if you are not presenting, please turn off your microphone and your video. If we get to a point where you're running out of time, I also will have my video off, but I'll pop my video back on. So if you see me show up, that's a hint to, to wrap it up. Um, for our attendees, you are welcome to use the chat throughout the presentations. If you have any questions you would like to ask of the panelists, which we will be doing at the end of each hour, so at uh, 7 o'clock Pacific time, we'll be, or about 6.45 Pacific time, we'll get into questions for this group in particular. Please submit those questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of your monitor there. Um, it looks like we are ready to go and I see that you're able to share your screen. So John, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, we got you on mute there. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Mark, for uh, allowing us to do this panel and, and join you. We're all members of the Southern Criminal Justice Association, but I'd like to travel out west to uh, see one of your meetings at some point. I know we have a brief amount of time, so instead of uh, doing lengthy introductions of each paper, I'll let the authors do those. We're starting off with Dr. Mitch Miller.
Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay. Great. Uh, so, uh, begin by saying uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Stogner for organizing this panel and for the WACJ for letting us uh, participate, uh, especially as a, a group of Southerners outside the region. We appreciate the opportunity to share some of our research with you. Uh, so all of the papers tonight uh, come from uh, a special issue that is online now, uh, uh, Springer, uh, the publisher of the American Journal of Criminal Justice, which uh, is the uh, journal of the Southern Criminal Justice Association, has a special issue out on uh, crime and justice during the coronavirus pandemic, as you can see on the shared screen with uh, uh, it's quite a fat volume uh, with, with 21 articles addressing a, a number of issues related to uh, COVID and uh, its impact on crime and or criminal justice, something uh, sure to be of interest in there to everyone. So uh, my uh, brief presentation tonight uh, is actually the, the first introductory article of this issue co-authored with uh, the well-known Al Bloomstein. Uh, we're uh, on Eastern time, so it was a little late for him. So unfortunately, he uh, can't be with us tonight. But uh, a lot of the thoughts that I'm going to share are, uh, are as much uh, or more his than my own. So uh, this is our, uh, the cover page of our article, uh, simply titled Crime Justice in the COVID-19 Pandemic Toward a National Research Agenda. So... When we start by thinking of envisioning a, a COVID discipline related research agenda, uh, you know, I guess it comes to mind people are like, well, you know, why would, what is uh, this research agenda and why would we need it? Well, the purpose of the research agenda is to better synthesize empirical research and uh, subsequent scientific uh, discourse that will follow so, to, to guide the inquiry and in, a linear manner that is connected to and responsive to the virus. Uh, so when we say for definitionally what we mean by a national research agenda, this would be akin to in what sociology and psychology we refer to as TRPs or theoretical research programs, but uh, we didn't like that language, uh, both it seemed kind of wordy and also it didn't seem to reflect the applied nature of the work that we do uh, in the in the criminal justice uh, in the problems of the criminal justice system, so uh, in in support or justifying the creation of uh, a COVID research agenda, we would argue that without uh, developing conceptual cornerstone, sort of an anchoring conceptual framework, I call it here on the screen, uh, research will predictably. Uh, just utilize and extend existing theories and uh, known successful research designs uh, in a reiterative nature, which tends to be, you know, what happens in the in the social sciences. And this may or may not, in turn, connect to and help actually address problems presented by the pandemic, both addressing uh, problems that the criminal justice system uh, can directly, which I'll speak to momentarily, and uh, the adjustments that the criminal justice system has to make because of the pandemic as well. So for the balance of my brief time tonight, I'll try to identify uh, these anchoring concepts for a COVID CCJ agenda and then talk uh, very briefly, mention some of the uh, foremost uh, research uh, opportunities and uh, conclude with some challenges for applied research during the pandemic. So, I suggest uh, four main cornerstones. Uh, that comes out nicely, I guess, when thinking of cornerstones, uh, the four, but it just so happened to work out that way, of, of a uh, COVID CCJ research agenda. The, the foremost, obviously, being that which everything else is responsive to, and that's contagion, fear of contagion, uh, or in many cases, as well, which is a big part of the problem, lack of fear of contagion. And then 
uh, this, the, the concept of containment, so where the virus is known to be, what is being done to uh, contain that literally, but to, to prevent its, its spread. And then also a conceptual cornerstone and anchoring concept of adaptation. Uh, obviously this would apply you know, at a micro level to our individual lives, to macro levels of all our social institutions, but in this context, we uh, clearly mean it in relation to the, the justice systems, the, the juvenile and the criminal justice system. And then our last anchoring concept would be social ordinance compliance. And uh, we tried to give a listing here of some of the, the foremost concerns. There are others as well, such as restaurant and bar uh, regulations and uh, restrictions on religious gatherings. But I guess you know some of these things are sort of subsumed under this general notion of just banned gatherings. So uh, by engaging in research uh, that is responsive to some or, or most of these uh, concepts, it will be more likely that the research will be actually responsive to doing something addressing the virus than, than without any sort of framework where we'll just continue along our usual criminological pathways, which uh, may, may you know, give you know, reaffirm uh, certain theoretical perspectives more so than others under anomic conditions. But uh, I don't know that that's the way to make our uh, work the most relevant, especially in terms of the, the crisis that we're facing. So uh, if we think of uh, COVID research opportunities, you know, well, three, I would say that they was, these would typologize uh, rather quickly in the three main areas. Clearly COVID effects on crime. Uh, I would refer you again to the guest, uh, guest uh, issue. There are uh, the special thematic COVID issue of the American Journal of Criminal Justice, which addresses uh, a wide range domestic effects of domestic violence. Uh, and, uh, hate crime is clearly connected to the virus, uh, but changes in criminal trends and patterns so these in turn, I mean, not to extend it to criminology per se, but, but uh, there's obviously a, a, a theory, methods, and substance symmetry here. Uh, so while the virus being a, an anomic phenomenon is just sort of, I guess, uh, the epitome of uh, testable uh, uh, hypotheses to emerge for routine activity theorists, there's also uh, a lot of theory testing opportunities for a, a number of perspectives, especially, I mean, Al and I never thought uh, of the virus lingering on this long back when we wrote this. But if you want, if you think of, uh, I think of my, my a good friend and colleague, Chris Shrek and his work on control theories, and especially how as the virus lingers on and people's patience wears thin, uh, how uh, self-control and impulsivity certainly uh, factor in uh, very much so. It seems that uh, people seem to justify their behavior not uh, like they were back in March in response to the extent of the severity of the virus in their location, but with sort of justifying comments of, well, I haven't been out or I haven't done what I wanted to in a long time, therefore now, you know, I should. Uh, but the uh, level of threat is the same, if not worse in many cases. So it seems uh, actually irrational when you break it down. Uh, and then, the criminal justice system, uh, we think of you know, the effects on operational you know, adaptations uh, in a day-to-day -day manner, but also in terms of the nature of crime enforcement. I mean, obviously, in many places, uh, with the practitioner partners that, that I'm working with on various grants around the country, it's pretty categorical to hear, well, we're trying as best as we can not to bring anybody and book them into the jail if we can avoid it. So. Uh, you wonder how uh, things are being regulated or if the virus is just sort of organically uh, minimizing the problem and if it lingers on long enough to, to at what point uh, the criminal element might become responsive to it and identify new opportunities. Another uh, element, which I'll only mention briefly because I know some of the other, uh, the other panelists are speaking in this, the areas of mental health and policing, but the effects, the effects of staffing, not just the pandemic, but its overlap with uh, with criminal justice reform, especially Black Lives Matters. I mean, we're hearing pretty much again categorically that 
uh, new applic that the number of new applications for open positions are down, and early retirements uh, are up. So at some point, this is going to compel uh, more and more overtime and burnout and officer resiliency, not just the officer's management of uh, the population's mental health issues during the virus, but their own mental health uh, is going to become uh, more of a concern as well. So these are, these are just uh, some quickly mentioned areas for research opportunity. I mean, there's clearly uh, 21 articles in the issue that uh, identify numerous more. Uh, so I'll uh, conclude here by saying that, you know, the virus has uh, clearly had vast impact on both pure and especially funded research throughout the country. I mean, all active studies have been interrupted, especially any that were qualitative uh, uh, and or mixed methods involving a qualitative dimension uh, in as much as we're simply not able to access subjects and travel and for that matter, funding uh, source agencies have banned uh, prohibited uh, reimbursement of travel during the, the virus to prevent its spread. Uh, so um, again, we see that you know the relevancy of the concern of contagion and containment. But uh, just in conclusion, for funded research, uh, I mean the, the disruptions are, uh, are are really challenging and have you know put a premium on uh, the skills of grants management. Everyone is certainly earning their money these days, uh, but uh, because of uh, not being able to travel and conduct uh, research as planned. Uh, all the timelines are having to be adjusted. This in turn triggers GANs, the grant justification notifications. I understand in the new just grant systems are now GAMs, it's changed to uh, grant adjustment modifications. So that, that's a new acronym for us all. Uh, obviously travel is banned, so we can't do site visits. This has impact for data collection and not just the regular data collection that we would get through our qualitative visits there through interviews or observational data or other techniques, but the regular official data that we do quantitative analysis on that they collect. I mean, this certainly doesn't reflect typical crime or, or response to crime or programming or, or treatment realities because the populations and the, the extent of the realities are not normative. Uh, so because of these other changes, there are domino effects that in turn will, will, will cause a lot of additional budget revisions. Uh, and this will go on for some time uh, into additional uh, grant justification uh, modifications through no cost extensions where all the grants will be uh, prolonged in order to be able to get all of the work done. So uh, I will uh, conclude by saying that one positive uh, or one uh, upside is that a lot of uh, the evaluation research because uh, just the, the partners would not agree either to political or ideological reasons or sometimes the numbers would not allow for comparison groups so uh, lesser uh, techniques had to be used the experiment uh, experimental design that we desire has sort of organically emerged in a lot of contexts and in the form of natural experimental conditions because of the virus so that's certainly one positive so thank you all for uh, listening to my overview, and I look forward to uh, listening to the other two panelists. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Wesley Jennings of the University of Mississippi. Can y'all all see that and hear me? We can see you, but if you're sharing a screen, we don't see that. All right. While you're working on that, I just want to point out that John answered uh, the first question that came in through the Q&A, providing a link 
to uh, the research that this group is discussing. So everybody, um, I will post that also in the chat so everybody has access to that. How about that? You can see the screen now, Taryn? Yep, you're good. All right, perfect. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about the research that I that I worked on. That, as Dr. Miller uh, mentioned in his in his uh, segment, as a part of a larger special issue on the impact of COVID nineteen on criminal justice uh, research and criminal justice system more broadly. My, the focus of my piece is on the immediate impact of COVID nineteen on law enforcement in the United States. So one one you know, caveat and, you know, an in, in, in important thing to say before I begin is that obviously in the title, the immediate impact, you also got to bear in mind and situate this research specifically in the time frame it was done in. Because in reality, this paper was conceptualized, uh, you know, the research was done, and the drafting and revisions of the paper occurred in literally starting a couple weeks after the pandemic hit in mid-March into early April. So all the research in this article was finalized prior to the, uh, you know, the related um, social justice and protests in the, in the George Floyd that occurred in, in late May. So, so that's some context to provide uh, for this research. So police officers obviously are on the front lines, frontline workers in general, but they're certainly also on the front line when you deal with pandemics. And as such, the officers themselves have a heightened risk of exposure and infection, given that they're out in the community and also in close contact with members of the community. But they still have these particular roles that are within their purview as part of their law enforcement uh, function. One being contain the spread, uh, two being to still serve the local community in the sense that obviously when individuals call on law enforcement calls for service, they still you know, have, to, have to and need to respond as, as, part, of the, as part of the mandate and, and their workload. But then ultimately they all still have to maintain public order, which can be obviously much more complex when you have a pandemic relative to traditional policing in a pre-pandemic or a, a non-pandemic environment. So at this point in time, the CDC uh, put forth three specific methods of primary methods of prevention that seemed extraordinarily novel <laughs> at the time, uh, but they're now basically on every, you know, sign in every restroom or hallway or, I mean, out in the restaurants and and, and everywhere you go into now in this space, so they're commonly known, but at the time they were they were relatively new in the sense uh, as defined uh, to at least to the to, to the lay public. One obviously being social distancing, maintaining a, a distance of at least, at least six feet from other individuals to avoid exposure, particularly avoiding uh, being within six feet of someone for more than 15 minutes, which the CDC has amended now to be. Uh, 15 consecutive minutes, but also 15 cumulative minutes in a 24 hour period. And the second one was to maintain proper hygiene by washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, and then avoiding touching one's face with unwashed hands. Those were the general framework that obviously also applied to law enforcement because that was, that was broadly um, marketed to the public as well. Soon thereafter, the CDC came out with several explicit and enumerated recommendations for first responders, which also included law enforcement officers. One was the importance of law enforcement officers wearing PPE, personal protective equipment, such as disposable gloves, disposable gowns or coveralls, wearing uh, face masks, particularly um, a N95 respirator mask in the absence of that, a cloth covering or some other alternative face mask was what was recommended. They recommend that law enforcement wear eye protection, such as, as goggles or a disposable face shield. They recommend that they clean and disinfect all their gear prior to reusing after they come, after they come into contact with an individual in the community. 
They encourage law enforcement to follow procedure and properly contain and dispose of the PPE that they were using after they've come into a contact with a community member. And then also following coming into contact with a community member to follow procedure to contain and to appropriately launder their clothing. The Vera Institute went a few steps further and provided a little more specific guidance for law enforcement that that you know complements, but it also uh, it goes a little bit above and beyond the recommendations that the CDC put forth early on uh, during the pandemic. Uh, specifically, they they wanted to ensure that 911 dispatchers divert calls for service in the sense that if it's not a crime related call and, it can, and maybe a mental health uh, professional could respond or a social worker, um, or they could just tap divert it and take care of it in the call center over the phone and take notes and have someone follow up later. They were, they're encouraging that. They're encouraging that, uh, as Dr. Miller mentioned, the idea of um, issue temporary directives to law enforcement, you know, pick those out on patrol, to release individuals which is a citation or a ticket or a summons for minor misdemeanor level, you know, ordinance related offenses, just ticket them and release them as opposed to arresting and transporting uh, to, to the jail. Also, they recommend to suspend protocols that, as I kind of mentioned, that to place people in custody. So to avoid avoid doing that, particularly for minor minor crimes, limit police response to low risk incidents. So where you know a call for a misdemeanor might generally necessitate you know at least two officers responding, or all the officers you know certain you know close area proximity would respond. They they recommend that that's just maybe one officer response to that scene and, and uh, rather relative rather than having multiple officers respond to a low risk incident. And then uh, recommend making limitations on officers who come into contact with department visitors. A number of agencies have, you know, stopped essentially the public from entering in the police department to, to uh, limit the spread there. And, uh, also, the Vera Institute encouraged law enforcement to expand the use of online reporting for citizen complaints or for actually doing police reports uh, online. And then they recommend to increase the cleaning and disinfecting and sanitizing of the, the patrol cars, obviously, but also the precincts, the police stations, and other high traffic areas where, where law enforcement uh, utilizes. So those are, the, those are the guidance that was early on from the CDC in general, the CDC's guidance for law enforcement specifically, and then amended and expanded by the Vera Institute. So these are a few examples of what specific law enforcement agencies had done as of mid, mid late March, early April in response to the, to the, to the uh, emerging pandemic. Specifically, for example, the law enforcement police, the Los Angeles Police Department shifted many of their detectives and other personnel to just daily patrol activities, particularly in high traffic areas to, to assist um, with enforcing the, so, the social distancing and, and the stay at home orders. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department actually also assigned their more specialized deputies, you know, narcotics and, uh, and, and gang related task forces to just work general in general crowded areas such as grocery stores uh, to make sure folks were wearing masks and, and, and uh, properly social distancing. The Tempe Police Department instituted what they call you know, a 50-50 work plan, which basically you have like shift A and shift B, and those shifts don't overlap whatsoever. That way those two groups of individuals never will uh, physically come into contact with one another, even in passing in the, in the department. The Miami-Dade Police Department, among other police departments as well, but they're one of the most notable in terms of early on, restricting the enforcement of evictions uh, citywide. Fort Worth in Texas, the police department there, the officers were actually prohibited from making arrests or certain misdemeanors without prior uh, supervisor approval. And the Phoenix Police Department early on recommended the public utilize their online crime reporting system versus going in person to, you know, um, request or to fill out a police report or even, or even calling 911. They just encourage them to go right to the online fillable form and submit their uh, concern in that, in that venue. Other obstacles that law enforcement face early on, particularly which obviously still continues to this day, 
is that they're one, they're tasked with communicating these voluntary measures. So in areas where there's not mandated mandates for masks, they have to still kind of enforce a, a voluntary measure. Social distancing is not really, you know, there's not really much out there as far as being a citation for not social distancing, but they have to just kind of remind people, encourage people, hey, you know, separate six feet, you know, social distance. Um, but they also were, were required to enforce actual quarantines and mandatory lockdowns and potentially where there was consequences for, for those government imposed restrictions early on. And then they have to juggle their many roles in addition to promoting compliance with these public health measures, but all still trying to build relationships with the community and public trust. It's very difficult when we're all told to stay away from each other, social distance, stay away from each other six feet, but then ask the law enforcement to engage in the community and work with them so they can Im improve uh, public trust and, and, and legitimacy. Also, law enforcement resources have been exhausted when they because they're now dealing with new demands in addition to their typical long list of job duties and tasks that, that the community expects of them. Then there's, there's financial burdens to agencies. Agencies had to purchase all this PPE. They have to store it all. They have to go through these deep cleaning. They've had, they've had to have, you know, uh, different, different approaches to, to staffing and allocating shifts. To, to, to incur social distancing as far as in the dispatch areas, the dispatch rooms, trying to separate those individuals as well. And so this is added resources that on, a, on agencies that are already taxed generally. A few other obstacles is the number of calls to police departments have increased generally as a result of increased calls of individuals saying, hey, we've noticed people at X restaurant or X mall or X uh, store not social distancing and or not wearing masks. And they're, you know, they oftentimes the police have to respond uh, in, in those situations. And, and then that's, and that's what the idea is that it's, it's, it's trying to balance that, you know, increased police presence to enforce the orders, but they're also there to try to, you know, assist, you know to, to buffer and hopefully improve community relations. And then Officers are reassigned to more populated areas of the city in many police departments because that's where the social distancing and, and concerns are the greatest, where you have more, more people, uh, more, more densely populated areas of the city. So it takes away from uh, policing in the rural uh, areas. And then there's been some evidence to suggest that actual crime, assault, and particularly domestic violence have increased in some cities, uh, at least early on in, in the pandemic, as a, re as a result of individuals being home and staying home. So directions for future research, agencies should have a detailed plan in place for these large scale kind of public health emergencies. Obviously this is a once in a lifetime scenario right now for, for most of us, but going forward, we now have experience in this. So agencies would plan, plan for that. They need to have a contingency plan in, in case they have a reduced workforce in terms of social distancing implications, but also in terms of uh, out, outbreaks in the police department. They need to figure out how they can, how they can cross train individuals. They need to maintain their inventory of PPE. They need to have a stockpile to be ready. Um, they need to work with local hospitals and public health departments and other agencies to, to have partnerships so they can share these scarce resources uh, in, in general in preparation for these kinds of events. They need to uh, outline the protocol specifically of what they would implement. So if they say we're going to enforce social distancing, isolation, quarantining, you know, they need to be explicit on what those mean and what the sanctions may or may not be relative to uh, non-compliance. And then also the idea of move, uh, go back toward decriminalizing things or issuing citations and, and warnings and summons as opposed to taking individuals into custody. So ultimately in closing, the, the pandemic obviously caught everybody off guard, certainly law enforcement, but also larger society. Uh, and the law enforcement's response immediately had to evolve, it's been evolving ever since, and it, continue, it will continue to evolve until the pandemic's uh, over. There wasn't any existing playbook for how, to re for how law enforcement should respond to this, because like I said, this was a once in a lifetime scenario. But ultimately, uh, individuals on the front lines, including obviously most notably law enforcement, do continue to play a vital role in shaping the US response and the world's response to, to hopefully curbing this pandemic, but they're also, uh, the responsibility is borne by members of the co community in general. The police, law enforcement can't do it on their own and the community can't do it on their own. Uh, both sides need to, do to play their part uh, to mitigate the spread and to hopefully uh, emerge from this pandemic in a better place.
appreciate you know you have let me have the opportunity to speak on this topic and here's the citation for the article along with the link to it and if you use your phone or ipad you can scan the qr code and it'll take you right to the article that you can access if you're interested in further reading Can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. So the charge that my co-authors and I had was to investigate and, uh, and sort of forecast the effect of the COVID pandemic on the health of police officers, particularly focused on uh, mental health. It was uh, a small portion of what the special issue of the journal did I'd uh, recommend that entire issue to to anyone that hasn't read it? We've got great works in there from looking at how COVID affected immigration to uh, Jim Halden's study on how it's affected cybercrime. There's uh, Molly Buchanan's work on on juvenile justice. Overall, a great piece. But uh, today I'm presenting the work I did with Brian Miller and Kyle McLean out of Clemson University on police stress and mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, what we're going to talk about is, is how the pandemic's effect on the mental health of first responders has been particularly profound. The, uh, we, we explored in our work using both anecdotal evidence that we gathered from our practitioner colleagues and other relevant events that we saw as the best possible analogies to our current situation, which would allow us to forecast what would happen or what is likely to happen with law enforcement officer uh, stress. And we'll talk about each of those, those analogies and what we glean from peer reviewed research on those topics. At the, the conclusion, we discussed avenues for providing officer support to minimize the deleterious effects of the pandemic on their mental health. So to provide a little background before we get started, if you're, uh, if you're not aware of policing, and even in the absence of a pandemic, is one of the most mentally taxing occupations. Law enforcement officers suffer from mental health problems at a rate much higher than uh, the general population. They're more likely to suffer from depression, familial strife, have uh, PTSD symptomology, misuse substances, and attempt alcohol or uh, attempt suicide as compared to members of the general population. But what we see is a situation like COVID creates uh, new stressors for law enforcement officers. Of course, they experience all the same stressors that you and I have experienced during the last nine or uh, nine or so months, but they've experienced others where we as, as professors can teach for home. They have not been able to. They're, they can't shelter at home. They can't avoid contact with the public. So there's certainly a degree of stress there. Many officers have reported isolation from the family because of the, the idea that we can't have, uh, we can't risk too many officers getting sick. So many have been avoiding their family that work in healthcare and other settings and may, uh, may have come into contact with individuals that do have COVID. They are at a prolonged threat of virus exposure, meaning they're out in public longer than than most of other members of society. They're having to enforce the somewhat unpopular at times stay at home ordinance. And, uh, and that has been a significant stress among many officers. The, uh, we've, we've got a number of stressors that come from PPEs as well. Early on in the pandemic, a big stressor was departments not being able to get PPE early enough. And that was particularly, uh, the burden of that was particularly applicable to our rural law enforcement jurisdictions. They, uh, they also had issues with modifying techniques to maintain social distance. It was uh, likely stress associated with, with new protocols in order to avoid uh, transmission of COVID-19. Certainly altered patrolling routines and changes to shift schedules were a source of stress early on and still a source of stress. Many groups have gone to the, uh, the cluster staffing where different groups come into contact with one another. That, uh, that eliminates a little bit of shift flexibility as associated with stress there and may have individuals working time periods 
longer or uh, more frequent than they would otherwise. You also see that they're dealing with more high stress encounters with individuals suffering from mental health problems because those mental health problems are being exacerbated by the fear of contagion, the economic problems associated with the, uh, the pandemic itself, resource shortages, and individuals experiencing isolation. So we, we've got uh, police officers experience the same pandemic-related stress we do and more on top of that. So what, uh, what Dr. Miller, Dr. McLean, and I did is explored what we viewed as the two most relevant historical analogies to this current situation, reviewed all peer-reviewed research on, uh, on each of these and law enforcement officer mental stress and used that to formulate a, a reaction or a, a guide for future research and perhaps policy dealing with this exacerbated stress. And those two events that we identified and discussed were the start of the HIV ap epidemic in the 1980s. So that, that specific time period where little was known about transmission risk and no treatment was, uh, was available. And we discussed also policing in the direct aftermath of September 11th, 2001. These were large scale distressing events that affected perceptions of safety, job stress, and altered the way in which they law enforcement officers went about their jobs, including uh, these events required law enforcement officers to deal with more individuals within the population that may have been traumatized by those events. So let's first talk about what we know as, uh, as criminologists about the HIV epidemic, or at least the early years of the HIV epidemic, and how it affected law enforcement officer stress. The reason we, we looked at the 1980s as, the, as a time period that was really a good analogy for what we're experiencing now is that that was a time when we had a great deal of uncertainty about HIV. Uh, as we say, uncertainty reigned three decades ago. Uh, certainly, it's better understood today. Treatment options are understood. Risk of transmission is much understood. But at the, that time, we had a situation where risk was misunderstood. Many law, office, law enforcement officers vastly overestimated their occupational risk. And HIV potential exposure was reported as a significant stressor, significant fear associated with being a law enforcement officer in an area where substance use was uh, common, particularly those using uh, intravenous drugs. So uh, <clears throat> we, we have a situation where they, they discussed and argued that the inability to manage their risk, intensified fear, the lack of knowledge, intensified fear, and evolving information was a source of stress among law enforcement officers, meaning they weren't uh, confident in the information they had, and that itself became a source of stress among law enforcement officers. One, uh, one study even described the threat of, threat of HIV exposure while policing as a source of PTSD, and, uh, and even in the 90s, it was still described as a major police stressor, though later works found that the more training law enforcement officers received on avoiding HIV exposure, minimizing HIV risk, that mental strain or mental stress was lessened with that, uh, with that training. We also developed or discussed policing post 9-11 as an analogy for policing during a, the early stages of a pandemic. Particularly, we see this as a valid analogy because we've got an invisible danger. You don't know the, the necessarily the, the source of, of danger. And much like the early days following the 9-11 attacks, there was a lot of distrust of available information. We still see that months later at, into this current pandemic. We, uh, we read works on, on post 9-11 policing stress and found that most, many of the officers in areas directly affected and within neighboring states reported heightened PTSD symptomology following the 9-11 attack, more reported needing mental health care. They reported being more on edge, uh, feeling stressed and hyper vigilant during that time. Other studies moving beyond that and uh, across the study, across the country to areas not directly affected by the 9-11 attacks described increased stress and found officers reported more stress at that time. Uh, notably, there was a shift in a, the most stressful 
concern among law enforcement officers before and after 9-11, where safety of citizens, offenders, and colleagues was the, the number one stress, the number one concern among officers prior to 9-11. Officers reported that the threat of hate group violence, riots, or terrorist attacks became their, their leading stressor. Organizational challenge, uh, changes exacerbated stress, and we're certainly seeing that uh, organizational challenge changes occurring now. We, uh, we also saw that the 9-11 effects on law enforcement mental health were disproportionately affecting female officers, and it's something we likely see where we could, using this analogy, we would expect to see following the COVID-19 pandemic, indicating that services may need to be provided even more so to female officers and, uh, as part of this pandemic. Again, we identified some of the current major stressors and PPE use and shortages, particularly shortages in rural areas was a major concern. Import enforcing unpopular mandates was, was another. And there seems to be a degree of stress associated with cognitive dis dissonance associated with the way policies are modified due to the way the pandemic is functioning. So uh, we, we've got jurisdictions advising officers to avoid arrests unless absolutely necessary, to avoid traffic stops, to ignore certain violations in order to minimize the number of people in jails, minimize their contact, minimize the risk to law enforcement officers. And this has uh, created a degree of stress among uh, law enforcement officers. Obviously the changes to the organizational policies and programs is a, is a key concern. And officers are reporting a more stressful workload because of the number of officers, particularly in urban districts that are calling in sick or are unavailable. You see that uh, from the NYPD, I put a stat on the slide that 15% are, have reported sick at some point and being unable to serve. So others have had to fill in. If uh, there's a great work in a special issue that I, I'll refer you to that most of these are just proportionally affecting rural agencies. So Dr. Hansen's work on that is, uh, is a great read, but that's argued in our work as well. We would think that these stressors are going to affect the law enforcement officers directly, but they're also going to affect their ability to deal with other stressors that come up both in their, their personal lives and on the job. I, uh, I refer you to Slocum's article on stress proliferation, and we've applied this to COVID-19 police response. Basically, the officers dealing with stressors associated with COVID-19 leads them will, or likely leads them to be less ready or less capable of successfully dealing with new stressors. So it's a, it's a, a problem there. And if you, uh, if you read certain biosocial works, it appears that an omnipresent stress like the pandemic is going to impact stress hormone levels, resulting in increased susceptibility to other stressors outside of uh, those associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. These issues are going to coalesce in an effect on police productivity, meaning that these job stressors generally directly impact performance indicators, stressors facilitate burnout. Mitch has already talked in his presentation about how we're seeing more officer turnover than, uh, than in previous time. And we are, <coughs> we, we certainly see that officer stress is inversely linked to job commitment. These stressors and the degree of stress associated with policing during a pandemic is also associated with, or likely associated with an increase in police misconduct because stress is associated with that increase. We uh, certainly also believe there's potential for increased misconduct during a time where they're experiencing unplanned and unrehearsed situations. Those are generally considered more than some of the most stressful roles assumed and thus those most associated with, with uh, maladaptive behaviors. We make a number of recommendations for future research on the impact of COVID on officers. First, 
we argue the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on officer stress must be quantified, both occupational stress and stress generally. We argue that the identification of officer characteristics and behaviors linked to successful coping following this traumatic event is key. The, the, the identification of those characteristics can help inform policy in terms of strengthening responses of other officers. And third, studies should focus on agency responses to COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, departments must focus on being logistically prepared for viral outbreaks, and departments must focus on providing officers with training to improve skills for positive coping in the face of extreme stress. Once again, our work is in the AJCJ special issue titled Police Stress, Mental Health and Resiliency During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And I was presenting on behalf of Brian Lee Miller, Kyle McLean, and myself. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I, your work is so interesting and of course, really important right now. Um, and looks like it could be extended significantly. I do have some questions for each of you regarding that. Um, Mitch, I'd like to start with you. You laid out these very clear cornerstones and I'm wondering about different types of long-term effects and ripple effects and how we can identify those. For example, it is perhaps easier to say um, medically fragile people were released from prison early. We can follow those medically fragile people, see if they reoffend, and you know, we can tie that back to this pandemic. However, when we look at you know, high school students or, or younger than that right now who are experiencing online education in a home where they may not even have the internet or a home where it's not safe or education is not supported, then we might see an increased an increase in delinquent or criminal behavior, and then down the line, an increased population uh, in the juvenile justice or criminal justice systems. I'm wondering if you have any advice on how we can link those things back and follow these ripple effects from, from this event based on the recommendations that you made for research during this time. Well, I agree with uh, what you just said, and I think that, uh, well, no one really wants to focus or think this way because it's probably negative. There's probably going to be, you know, various, uh, and no one knows exactly where because, you know, it's unprecedented, but uh, probably like maybe we could think of them conceptually as tolerance thresholds. You know, like, like I mentioned briefly how, like, you know, just in day-to-day -day life, you know, neighbors are now justifying doing what they would have been afraid to have done in, you know, March or April because the, uh, the uh, contagion rate was actually lower then than it is now. It's like here in Florida, it's just you know, off the charts, really bad. But now people are like not even half as cautious as they were back then, simply because their patience is worn out. You know, they just, whatever, you know, the, the trigger may be, I can't have, you know, an, another hour of another child screaming or, <laughs> or, or be trapped in the house, you know I mean? Uh, I'm luckily a workaholic, but I literally have bought one take of gas since March. So, you know, I mean, people uh, that aren't so absorbed, like, you know, in their work at home approach, I can see how this would become a real, real problem. So, I mean, if it has implications for everyday social life, it has to have implications for criminal behavior as well. Uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention at all, but uh, in most of the uh, BGA, uh, like the Justice for Mental Health and the uh, rural opioid projects that I'm working on around the country is uh, I mean, the biggest one is the switch from uh, regular treatment to telehealth. And uh, so I mean, that's, you know, that's clearly going to be a growth area. I, I, mean, I know that that will, I mean, you said to link back. I don't really know how that will link back to some of the uh, some of the theoretical perspectives necessarily are those lines of inquiry, but in terms of having like, you know, a pragmatic real world impact of, you know, solving the problems. So then you, you know, but you also say, well, what might this look like rippling or going forward? I think that once telehealth gets embedded in places and people see, hey, this is easier, this is more efficient, this is, you know, a good solution, then some of those uh, more traditional jobs won't come back, or if they do, not in their entirety, but maybe more of a part-time kind of 
capacity. So, I mean, that's to be determined, but I think we can certainly expect there to be unintended consequences. <laughs> Didn't unmute myself. I think unintended consequences is going to be the name of the game going forward with this. Um, and you're absolutely right that we just, none of us have any idea what to expect. Uh, Wes, I'd like to come to you next. There have been uh, some questions that have come in. It's interesting with the timing of the stress that you've, uh, that you looked at with the police. I'm wondering, well, Stephanie mentioned in the chat that the issues regarding stress and crowd or riot control is probably the scariest part of this, given how high emotions are going to be over the next couple of months. Um, so we know that things, at the time that, that you looked at this, you, know, you, were, you were just dealing with the global pandemic. <laughs> and then 2020 kept happening and it kept getting worse. And so added on to that then was, you know, social unrest and all these protests. So I'm wondering what you would change if you did this study later in 2020. And um, also while you're at it, one of the other questions was if you were able to measure compliance with, with the guidelines you were discussing. Uh, yeah, like I said, the, the data that we, that we gathered from, from that in late, late March, early April was primarily just obviously news, news related stories that were quick to emerge, you know, daily. And at that point in time, there wasn't enough, you know, time in the sense to even, to even have any, any, any real data analysis on compliance or lack thereof, because these, these policies were literally still being crafted uh, and, and defined and, you know, and, and, and really in their infancy in terms of implementation. Uh, I definitely think, you know, if, if you're looking now, it's, yeah, that if you have snapshots of, if you want to think the term broadly policing in a pandemic, right, and then took snapshots of like March and April, you know, June and July, August, September. I mean, th those snapshots would look very different because because the other things that society was grappling with, uh, you know, in general, but obviously that law enforcement were, were on the forefront of that as far as, you know, related to, you know, protests and, and the riots and, and those kinds of things. Uh, but just talking with, I've also talked with a number of, you know, sheriffs and police chiefs and, and they, they, one of the issues that they've said that they had to deal with early on and particularly, you know, even now is related to the idea about you know, fatigue or, you know, or, or, you know, fatigue of pan pandemic fatigue and said, okay, I'm just going to stop wearing this mask. Because I'm just tired of wearing this thing. They're like the issue with the law, a lot of law enforcement is trying to get them to wear the masks in the police department. Right. Because for a lot, for law enforcement, that's like their home. They're like, I go out, you know, I go out with these people, and, you know, and we're in, we put ourselves in danger all the time. We're in, we share the same car and all those kinds of things. And, and, and it was difficult for the, for the, you know, uh, police chiefs and the, and the sheriffs to, to get their officers to, to buy in and, and to, and to, uh, you know, uh, to, to respond to the importance of one, it's important to keep you guys safe, but also we're certainly modeling the behavior for those on the outside. So a number, a number of them had to, they immediately went to one officer patrol cars, no more sharing cars, uh, you know, just, just to, you know, to, to reduce that likelihood of, you know, non-compliance in those situations. So it's not just the community having to, you know, grapple and deal with, with these kinds of things. It's also, you know, trying to get the law enforcement themselves to, to be on board with it. And if they're not act actively doing it, then how do you expect them to actively enforce it if they don't necessarily don't, may, may not agree with it too. So that so that's one of the, one of the narratives and the, and, and, the, and the complexities that a lot of law enforcement agencies that they've had to deal with too internally. Oh my gosh, I'm being the worst one at unmuting myself, sorry. So it's not just the compliance of the public, but the compliance within the agencies themselves. So exactly. interesting, thank you. Um, John, I wanna to come to you next and build on that, but I also wanna point people to the discussion going on in the chat that Mitch and John have, have both participated in um, about uh, different, different racial and ethnic communities and how, how they're affected during this time. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to discuss that out loud, so I, I would just recommend everybody go check out the chat. But John, if you could wrap us up here, you compared this experience to HIV and to 9-11, uh, which were both incredibly stressful for law enforcement. We now have compounding 
issues. Um, oh, and I see now that the chat hasn't gone to the full audience. So just kidding, you can't go read it there. Um, but we'll post some of the most pertinent information for, for everyone. Thank you, Alicia, for letting me know that. Um, okay, so there are now, when we compare it to 9-11 and HIV, the, with the pandemic, that makes perfect sense. But like we were talking about previously, this is now compounded because, because of the social unrest that happened this summer and everything else. And now there are fewer people joining police departments or, or, or uh, wanting to be police officers. I was wondering if you could speak to that and if that maybe is future research for you or what you recommend there. See, now you're muted. You're taken after me. It's certainly something that we, we have to consider. It's going to be a situation where you have to evaluate the effects of COVID-19 on police stress and, and willingness to join the police stress, or force, explore the effects of the current social climate on police stress and willingness to join the police force, and then perhaps a synergistic effect of those two big concerns that likely weigh heavily on individuals considering joining law enforcement or considering leaving law enforcement. I, I think one of the things that I, I've noticed after we, we published our piece in reading follow-up works and works from other countries that, uh, that look at basically the, the same topic is that we're going to have a challenge in quantifying these stressors and their effects on law enforcement. We, uh, we sometimes struggle with, with measurement. It takes time to get the right measures to understand the phenomenon or phenomena we, uh, we, we really want to understand. And both of these are, are new situations or, or somewhat new situations for law enforcement officers. And we've got studies trying to quantify their their effect on mental health of law enforcement officers in different ways. So I, I see it being a great challenge and a great avenue for future research. It's something that we may not fully understand until decades later, sort of like I, I think it took 20 years after the 1980s for us to understand how HIV affect police mental health. It may take us several years before we understand how COVID affected mental health of police officers. Yeah, great point. Thank you, each of you. And I especially want to point out that I know it is very, very late your time. So <laughs> thank you for working with our Western time zone and joining us today. Uh, I will go ahead and clear you off the screen now so you can all go to sleep and bring on our next round of panelists. So thank you. All right, our next round of panelists, I am coming to you now. Uh, we're gonna learn some more about how COVID has affected uh, different areas of the criminal justice system. And I will share the pertinent information from the chat uh, with the whole group at, at some point here. Okay, I think I've got everybody now. All right, so for our next hour, we're gonna be looking at, um, whoa, excuse me. <laughs> we're gonna be looking at data-driven di improvements to public safety first, and that's gonna be David and Megan. Um, I would remind everybody, continue to use the chat. And if you have any questions for our panelists, go ahead and submit those to the Q&A. And for our presenters, please turn off your microphones and your videos if you're not presenting. And I will pop up if you start going over time. And David and Megan, you go, go ahead and go for it. So I want to say uh, thank you. I appreciated the uh, conversation earlier. I was able to, to come in early and, and listen to the whole thing. Uh, and it was, oh, let's try that again. Let's reshare. Uh, there we go. Uh, and, you know, listening to what Dr. Jennings was, was discussing in terms of how do we, how do we measure this and certainly the other conversations. And uh, so what I'm going to do is introduce you to the work that we're doing out here at Washington State University. 
really what we've been developing and I'll, I'll make a transition to talk a little bit about some of the COVID projects that we're exploring, but I want to give you a little bit of background in terms of uh, what we've been doing out here. Um, so this is really a multidisciplinary research team. So we have communication experts, uh, experts in audio analytics, uh, computational um, math in terms of analytics, um, uh, effective artificial intelligence, which will make sense in a moment. This was truly, um, you know, a multidisciplinary effort because we recognized that, you know, police body worn camera, you know, was, you know, it's kind of, kind of ubiquitous. Everyone had body worn cameras and yet they were not uh, leveraging them. They were not um, taking that footage and, and converting it into data. And so WSU had a grand challenge. And the idea behind it was how can you engage in research that improves society? And we were very fortunate to win one of those awards. And in doing so, we developed a research lab custom software. So currently uh, we process over 15,000 hours of body worn camera footage. Uh, we work with you know, several different agencies, broken down some here, two large urban departments, uh, small departments and medium sized agencies. Um, some of you may be familiar with our, our published work in uh, the Journal of Research in Crime and Delinquency and our use of force and the timing of use of force. Uh, we were uh, uh, I guess last year we had criminal justice and behavior that looked at our work on negative emotionality and kind of the contextual determinants of negative emotionality in police citizen contacts. Um, we have been you know, working with undergraduate researchers, a little over 100 uh, currently. And what the goal of all of this is to understand what police citizen interactions look like. Uh, you always hear the most important decisions are made at the lowest level of the organization. And what we wanted to do was work with agencies to operationalize their footage. You, you, know, you look at the research that Lum and, and her colleagues in, in both the, the Campbell Review and the Systematic Review that they uh, conducted on the state of body-worn camera research. And what remains consistent is that agencies are not maximizing it. Researchers, we're not looking at it as a source of data. We know that it's there, but there's all these challenges. And so what we've been trying to do is really work with researchers and we've answered a lot of questions uh, from colleagues throughout the nation that are interested in working with this footage and, you know, and really breaking it down into objective components. And that's what we've done. So our systematic social event modeling is, is built upon identifying objective measures which is either deconstructing events into you know, zero or one. Um, you know, did the officer you know, conduct a search, zero or one? And then everything gets placed on a timeline. And I have a video, very brief video to kind of show you what we do here. Uh, now, I give you that background to really talk about you know, the research that we're doing right now. And it lines up perfectly with what we just heard about stress and, and understanding how, you know, the police citizen context, how they've changed, how stress impacts decision making. And as many of you know, there's, there's a state of kind of inconsistency. We know that policing is stressful, but how different is that stress from other similar professions, which most often the connection is to nursing. We're not well situated to understand and contextualize stress in effective states and how they influence decision making. We know that we've over relied on cortisol testing and we're trying to you know, un, you know, think through better, I don't wanna say better, different alternative methodologies. So what we've been building towards is by deconstructing police body cam footage and placing it on a timeline, what we're able to do is to really think through what's contextually happening. You know, is it, you know, what contributes to the results that we see, the decisions that are made. And as we all know from studying you know, policing that you can make a lot of missteps and get what we consider to be a good outcome. And I know I realize it's normal in terms of good or a poor outcome, but this is kind of a consistent issue, right? Is that we, we kind of study those outcomes without that consideration to kind of contextually what happens. And this is one of the arguments that we made in our, our work on negative emotionality, really trying to understand what contributes to the decisions that are made. You know, do we see 
you know, this reciprocal relationship between as, you know, this person escalates, the officer escalates their intensity and they just, they feed off of each other. So for us, this is really about trying to baseline interactions and then understand the decisions that are made, what contributes to them, and really bring the study of policing down to what happens. And by using the software, we're happy to share out you know, what we did, our code books. We truly have tried to be as transparent as possible so that we can have other researchers join this initiative to help agencies uh, really leverage this footage. So part of this is we ran a successful pilot where we collected uh, biometric measures of stress. And essentially what we do, and this is a, a very basic example, is being able to, you know, as you pull across here, you'll see each of these little marks. And these are indications of very specific events. Now we've put Fitbits and we've used a lot of different technologies and happy to talk about some of the tools that we've decided to use. But what's really helpful is that when you have these measures of stress and they're on a timeline, and then we're able to deconstruct what's happening in that interaction, right? And we can tell you around this time point, these are all of the events that are happening that by successfully merging these together, what we've been able to do is start to contextualize what stress looks like. See that the chat that's over there, so I just wanna move that out of the way. So with that, I wanna talk about some of the infield projects. And I don't have the COVID project, so I, I'm gonna start with that given the topic of the night, is that we were approached by an agency that wanted to understand how much time their officers were spending explaining the law, uh, were their officers wearing PPE, uh, were they providing PPE to uh, community members who did not have them, how was that received? And because this agency is not uh, deleting their footage, we now have this unbelievable timeline of pre-COVID contacts, you know, once, uh, you know, we're kind of operating in a COVID environment. And in Washington, we've actually kind of went through a, you know, kind of a sequester order. And then as we move through to, you know, a mask mandate, everyone has to, and then we have a city ordinance where people can be fined for not wearing a mask. And we've been able to identify all of those contacts. The agency has been phenomenal in flagging all of those for us. And so with that, we can really study how officers uh, approach these contacts, how people respond to the officer, as well as looking at, you know, the level of seriousness given to this in terms of how officers um, are explaining the law, thinking about those elements of procedural justice. Uh, some other projects, this, is, this aligns actually very well with this, this notion of uh, kind of key performance indicators that the agencies that we work with, they create um, these KPIs that all officers are required uh, to do for a given type of contact. And we can really start to, to study how that varies over shift, at the end of the shift, what contributes to uh, their ability to, to meet those key performance indicators. Um, the piece that we published in Crime and Delinquency really gets at the heart of baselining the timing of use of force, so how quickly in an interaction, the duration of applied force. We have some follow-up pieces uh, coming out from that, really connecting to officer and suspect injury to understand how delaying um, the use of force may contribute uh, to officer or suspect injury, really trying to explore that. They actually emerged from uh, quite a few agencies that were concerned that being a de-escalation uh, first uh, agency uh, might be contributing to injury and they wanted to be able to use their data and look at the timing of how force was being applied and kind of contextualizing force. Um, one of my doctoral students last year who now has uh, her own job at an amazing university, um, uh, her dissertation was looking at uh, body-worn camera footage and really deconstructing officer adherence to key training. Um, and then of course uh, we have been working with our agency partners on a rather large study on one, trying to understand what de-escalation looks like or non-escalation practices um, and uh, truly trying to create, well, seeing if we're able to create an instrument uh, to truly identify what de-escalation looks like. And so that's just a couple of the projects that we have currently going on in field. I think the COVID project is the one that we are truly excited about 
uh, to just, again, understand what these contexts look like, um, trying to think about stress and how officers you know, adhere uh, to training, how people respond to them, uh, and certainly our, uh, our work on stress and taking effective measures of stress or effective states um, and merging that into our timeline extrapolation of what actually happened in that interaction. So when you bring all these together, uh, you know, we, we're very uh, excited to be able to, to you know, study you know, what police citizen interactions look like um, and then thinking about them from really this kind of uh, temporal perspective, right? Like many of the research that we would have is, is you know, we would dichotomize if something occurred, but in many ways, it's as important to know when that occurred. And you think about something like procedural justice, you know, it's like, did it all occur after the arrest, right? And you know, we've been deconstructing the video using our, some of our procedural justice instruments, and that's what happens. It's, you know, it's all the, the, the procedural justice components are all after. And then everything that led up to, before they made that determination and said that the state of this person is under arrest, you know, if we weren't thinking about this from a time perspective, we would just simply say that procedural justice occurred and here's all the dimensions of it and they occurred in this interaction when the reality is yes, they are occurring, but they're occurring after that decision. And so for us, being able to deconstruct what police citizen interactions look like relative to entire, the entirety of the interaction is, is, is truly insightful. Um, and I will add time intensive, <laughs> very time intensive. Uh, Megan Parks is uh, the lab, she's here, she's the, the lab manager, um, and it is very difficult to manage all the videos uh, because what we do is we take every officer's perspective. So if there are four officers on scene, we are annotating what every single officer is doing on scene. And to do that, you know, creating that software system uh, that we did has really enhanced our ability uh, to really look at what's happening at that level of the interaction and then supplementing that with institutional data. And so that's a kind of a brief overview of, of what we do out here at Washington State in the lab and uh, certainly open to any questions. I know they'll be at the end. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, Megan, we'll definitely be coming to you with questions. So don't think you got off scot-free here. Um, I'd like to go ahead and move to our next presentation with um, Thomas Dutcher on punishment creep and mistrust. All right, let me just uh, share my screen and then I'll uh, introduce myself to everybody. All right, well, so my name is Thomas Dutcher. I am a PhD student at the University of New Haven in Connecticut. Uh, so first off, I'd like to thank the WACJS for allowing me to present here today. Um, and yeah, what I'm here to talk about is a subsection of a larger qualitative study I've been working on of the lived experience of men with incarcerated partners. Uh, and this specifically looks at uh, punishment creep and feelings of uh, mistrust due to lack of legitimacy in the criminal justice system that arise in these non-incarcerated partners. So with that being said, the overarching uh, motivation for the entire study uh, comes from this 2014 philosophical work on moral and ethical systematic obligations that nations that rely on incarceration have to the families of the incarcerated. Uh, crucial within these is this idea of the search for knowledge, especially for us as uh, researchers and academics. This uh, form of obligation is geared directly at delving into these topics so as to find out what are the underlying mechanisms for what is going on. The others that you'll see here uh, frame the research when it comes to uh, policy implications. This nestles nicely within Tyler's overarching literature on legitimacy within the criminal justice system. While most of this writing is related to policing and courts, it can be applied to corrections and has been done so uh, by himself, especially with these concepts of voice, neutrality, uh, treating individuals with respect and fostering a trust for authority. However, this previous research has solely focused on those that are incarcerated, not the families of the incarcerated. And as I said, what you will see here today is one 
important thematic structure of this overarching experience, experience of what it means to be a man with an incarcerated spouse. So again, because this is a little different from what we've been talking about thus far, a little bit of background information just to situate this uh, is that punishment literature, especially in the United States, uh, only within the last 20 years or so has it begun to focus on the effects on the family. When it does so, it primarily focuses on one of two groups of individuals, uh, those being children or caregivers of children. Most frequently, this research does tend to be about uh, strains encountered. Uh, this is where this term punishment creep comes from. It's uh, akin to secondary prisonization or symbiotic harms, depending on who you're reading. And in general, this research tends to be geared towards maintaining social ties uh, and the importance of doing so. Looking at literature from the UK, however, we do see that there is a bit of research that touches on this idea of legitimacy. Uh, within this body of research, it typically still focuses on individuals who are experiencing incarceration rather than their families. The handful of studies that have examined the role of families uh, tend to look at civic engagement as a proxy for systematic legitimacy rather than uh, direct opinions on the criminal justice system. Uh, however, the last line you'll see here from Hutton et al. actually examines uh, the experience of prison visitation and how families visiting incarcerated loved ones experience uh, courtesy stigma through the lens of Goffman. The work that myself and Dr. Barnsini have been working on uh, is essentially a phenomenology. Thus far, it consists of seven in-depth semi-structured interviews with men with incarcerated spouses. Uh, these interviews have been on average about 60 minutes long. Uh, they're coded through a line by line analysis, which averages about 300 to 380 lines of single thematic units. But uh, what I think is interesting to discuss uh, a little bit in length, especially due to the structure of this uh, panel, is the specific methodology I've been using for participant recruitment. So as already touched on, prison visitation in the vast majority of states, Connecticut included, has been uh, canceled since March. Uh, this caused a significant shift in uh, participant recruitment. Uh, what we ended up doing, and what I've been focused on using, is private Facebook groups and message boards that are related to familial incarceration. So prior to posting anything within these groups, uh, when I submit applications to join these groups. I am very clear with the moderators of these pages, uh, exposing myself as a researcher, providing them with background information to what the study is to see if the flyer would be applicable and wanted within this group. Uh, the big bonus of this is that it has extended the potential research pool to a nationwide sample as opposed to just a, reg a regional sample, which was the original idea. Uh, alongside with this, there is a source of potential sample bias here in that uh, it's only targeting individuals that have uh, internet access and capabilities as well as that are seeking out these uh, forms of groups. Uh, within this research, a direct question that is asked towards everybody that a lot of this thematic uh, extrapolation has come from is if they can speak to their experiences with the criminal justice system specifically as a result of their partner's incarceration. Uh, additional insights, however, have been gleaned through non-directly related questions, uh, wherein talking about visitation, uh, talking about strengths and stress encountered, uh, glimpses into views of systemic legitimacy do come forward. The overall interview encoding uh, has been through a phenomenological method uh, using Van Manen as uh, the key methodology here. Uh, not to delve too much into what phenomenology is, but essentially it is involves the hermeneutic circle as per Heidegger, uh, looking at textual parts against the whole narrative of the interview. Uh, through doing this, you code themes. Um, memos are especially important. This is why video calls, which I will get into in just a moment, uh, have been a major methodology of this piece. Uh, comparison of themes against themselves produces essential and incidental themes toward the overarching experience rather than geared towards these isolated individual 
narratives. Uh, bracketing is especially important uh, so as to eliminate potential uh, researcher bias. But again, what I think is more pressing to focus on here, given the nature of the panel, is the use of video calls. So obviously with abiding by quarantine procedures, especially over the summer when a majority of these interviews took place, uh, and not sharing a shared state or space with the majority of these interviewees, uh, I opted for video calls. Uh, video calls I viewed as something more personal than uh, an audio call, which I believe has led toward uh, more in-depth responses from participants, and also is essential for, for a phenomenology in that nonverbal communications, such as nervous jittering, uh, crying, uh, thought during long pauses can all be recorded and used to contextualize the narratives of these individuals. The overarching biggest advantage through using video calls I have found is that it constructs a hyper reality version of a shared space. So within memos for these interviews, and this is something I think we can all relate to and part of why I'm sitting with this bookshelf behind me is how you construct the, perf the performativity of the space that you choose to have your video call in. Uh, this again is more important to the overarching research, but it is something worth considering for those of us who prefer to engage in qualitative work and are seeking uh, new and potentially creative avenues for continuing to do so while still abiding by social distancing protocols, uh, university guidelines surrounding how one might be able to do this. Of course, some drawbacks that exist, internet connectivity issues. Still, this is a non-shared space. Anything typically from the waist down, you're not gonna see in terms of mannerism, so jittering legs especially to indicate nervousness might not be available. And again, there is this potential bias of those that are more technologically savvy. Uh, however, as I've said, through the, all the interviews I've done with these uh, seven men thus far, all have been willing to participate over video interview. Uh, so I do think that this is quite a uh, reasonable avenue going forward. In a general sense, the experience of men with incarcerated spouses and their views of state legitimacy, it's a heterogeneous experience uh, that is overwhelmingly negative with the occasional mixed, slightly positive experience thrown in there uh, and isolated positive interactions with correctional staff and the prison system as a whole. These uh, instances can be grouped within three overarching categories, being direct experiences, vicarious experiences, and perception shifts to negotiate image of spouse. And what I think is uh, important to do here now is discuss some of these uh, backed up with the words of these men that have been interviewed. And so again, due to the nature of this panel, communication with facilities is of essential importance. Also, what was interesting to come out of this research is this is one of the areas where some positive experiences are held. And so an example of a positive experience that then becomes a negative one uh, within communication is as follows, coming from one interviewee. When COVID hit, they were giving us three free calls a week but then they took that away. Now they only give us two a month. It's really crazy if you think about it. Only two calls a month, but there's still no visits. And many of us are still out of work. What am I supposed to do? Um, I think it's important to note that although they recognize that a favor was done to them in a sense that something proactive was established, they're also quick to recognize that these potential gains have not matched the length of the pandemic. However, more common are instances such as these. I gave up calling to find out about lockdowns. It takes forever to get a straight answer. Now I just assume if I don't hear from her, there's a lockdown. But it still makes me pace by the phone. Or, pulling from another interview, I'm sad tonight. I just found out there's a limit to how much money I can put on the phone a month. She tried calling, I went to add money, and they said I can't add more this month. Now, while that's not directly related to uh, communication, it is directly related to punishment creep via financial strain. Uh, what is 
I think also essentially important to note when it comes to punishment creep is that a lot of these instances of punishment creep come from quotes such as this. When we're going, what are we going to do when I get out? I mean, when she gets out, I guess there isn't really a difference. The staff don't care about family members. I've seen it from both sides now. They see it as a luxury. And so a potential source of, uh, that is hard to parse out in these interviews, they also see here under prior experiences, several of these individuals interviewed uh, were formerly incarcerated themselves. And so although prompted to give responses specific towards what they have experienced with their spouse, there is no surefire way of knowing whether their own experience is influencing this. However, uh, stemming from what literature has been done on this field of legitimacy, it is likely that this is a factor. Vicarious experiences um, tend to tie in directly to this idea of a lack of communication. Uh, point three here is one that I especially wanted to touch on as it most directly relates again, is this idea that and part of this would be that all of these individuals were contacted through message boards, is that message boards serve as this alternative source of information when uh, there is a failure of garnering information from uh, facilities. However, these boards tend to be primarily filled with overarchingly negative experiences and reports. Uh, so message boards are where they turn, and we see this in statements such as, I mean, I never call them anymore. If I want to get the, and then emphasized by the individual truth, using air quotes uh, when they talked, um, I don't talk to name of facility. When I want the real truth, I talk to, and then the name of the group. Um, the symbiotic experiences are also core to this. Uh, these largely center around financial strains and this idea of schedulization. Schedulization is often linked to being uh, felt like one must constantly wait around the phone for particular calls around certain times uh, and structuring their daily routine around specific phone calls. Uh, this structuring can become as extreme as one individual who uh, had to purchase a landline and get a provider in that sense so that they could talk to their spouse. But again, these vicarious experiences serve to further undermine uh, the views of legitimacy on the part of these individuals. And it is largely because of this third theme, this uh, cognitive dissonance that occurs when trying to reconcile the act their spouse committed with their uh, rose-colored glass view of her as their spouse. And so uh, a good quote that I think emphasizes this as derived from these interviews is uh, everything about the way they are treating her is cool. They don't care about who she is. Or from another interview, uh, when asked specifically about um, how they view the incarceration of their spouse. Well, one, the cops and the judge, her sentence is bogus if you ask me, and based on the words of a real criminal. They're all to blame in my opinion. And so we start to see the spillover effect where it's not only uh, the prison system that is to blame, it is the uh, entirety of the system. And as detailed out through these interviews, uh, it's the sense that the system has derailed any positive gains they may have been making to overcome addiction. Uh, and in general, while found in every interview, it tends to reinforce these negative experiences. It becomes this idea of um, so she is being punished unjustly, and we must address this. Uh, overarching conclusions, uh, just to sum up really quick, uh, is that uh, one negative experience tends to very drastically shape the perceptions of the overall system. Uh, the small amount of positive experiences that are framed tend to be hedged in overarching negatives. Uh, the most positive experience ever recorded so far in these interviews was also featured through an interview where the individual quickly thereafter said, but just so you know, I don't trust the DOC as far as I can throw them. Uh, just to touch on one policy implication real quick, since uh, it's clear that I'm almost up on time here, would be um, 
the idea of compensation and lessening the cost of communication for these phone calls, especially since uh, prison visitation is still shut down in most states. So for example, state of Connecticut, the uh, cost of a phone call for 15 minutes is just over $4, uh, which if you factor in loss of jobs, uh, inability to visit, it quickly becomes uh, an increased financial burden that uh, can be insurmountable at times. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we're going to go now to Alicia and Samaria talking about judicial reform during a crisis. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to set up the PowerPoint. Oops. Um, which screen am I showing? I can see your PowerPoint with your notes. Thank you. Fixing that. There you go. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody. And once again, we are an East Coast crew uh, coming in. So thank you to the WACJ for having us this evening. My name is Alicia Gagnon. I'm a PhD student at the School of Criminal Justice at UAlbany. And I'm joined this evening by my co-author. Hi, my name is Samaria Alpern and I'm an undergraduate senior at Brown University studying urban studies. And this evening, we're here to discuss some of the how-tos of judicial reform during this time of crisis. Uh, this is one of the snapshots that was mentioned um, or suggested earlier in this panel of how things are operating currently. And this research should definitely be continually explored as the pandemic continues and after it ends. Without further ado, getting into what we did. Um, so to start off, we have a quote we want to share with you all. Uh, the pandemic, as awful it has been, has opened up areas to revisit how we operate. And this was from Honorable Judge Edwina Mendelssohn. Um, this quote likely resonates with many of us on this call this evening. The scope of the loss, trauma, grief that the U.S. and indeed the entire world has faced in this last year has been enormous. Uh, further, the pandemic is not the only crisis facing the U.S., as we noted earlier in this panel as well. Systemic racism is an issue our institutions have not been able to adequately address. This has once again been highlighted by the continued efforts of the Black Lives Movement and others in the wakes of the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and in the juvenile justice system, Cornelius Frederick, as well as many others. Racial and ethnic inequities have been further highlighted in the disparate health and economic impacts of the pandemic. This is a complex combination of crises, so we're not trying to describe the pandemic as seen through rose-colored glasses, but we do want to recognize that times of crisis provide opportunities to revisit normal operations. Uh, this is an opportunity to change, study, and evaluate what the next normal can be. And we specifically explored the role of youth and family court judges, one of whom we quoted above uh, Judge Mendelssohn. As you may have expected, based on our quote, uh, our research was primarily uh, comprised of semi-structured interviews with Honorable uh, Judge Edwina Mendelssohn, as well as Honorable Judge Stephen Teske. I'd like to provide a little bit of context about these judges and why we so specifically selected them for our interviews. Uh, judge Mendelssohn is the Deputy Administrative Judge for Justice Initiatives in New York State. This is a statewide policy-oriented position and she has had decades of experience in and around the uh, family court system in New York State. She has been involved in New York State-based reforms, including New York City's Close to Home Initiative, which completely changed the practices of youth detention in New York City, as well as the recent rollout of the Raise the Age legislation. So for those of you who are not New Yorkers, uh, New York State recently changed the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18, uh, and this has been accompanied by a lot of logistical system-wide changes that she has been helping to uh, troubleshoot throughout the state. Honorable Judge Stephen Pesky uh, is the Chief Judge of the Juvenile Court of Clayton County, Georgia. He is widely recognized for his reform efforts over the past couple decades and uh, that he has implemented in his courtroom, including school-based restorative justice practices. And you may recognize the name Clayton County if, like me, you were closely watching Georgia this past week, counting all of the votes with the election. 
the different political backgrounds judges uh, exist in and do their work within uh, was one of the um, differences that we wanted to explore and have present in the conversations. Uh, we hoped that these different contexts would have some mixture of unique and overlapping recommendations for others in also varied judicial positions uh, who are interested in uh, motivating reform uh, in the court system. Together, these two judges have over 50 years of judicial experiences, and we are incredibly grateful for them for the time they shared with us and for uh, giving us the ease uh, by allowing us to share them by name. Um, in addition to our interviews, we conducted a review of some of the recent works that they have been a part of, which included blog posts and articles that they've written, as well as other panels that they presented on uh, over the last few months, specifically in the context of the pandemic and the uh, active reforms that they are implementing and working under uh, in their courtrooms. And then we, from there, identified some themes and used some peer-reviewed literature to support some recommendations that we want to share with you tonight. Okay, so as Alicia mentioned, throughout our interviews with Judge Mendelson and Judge Teske, we identified a number of concrete suggestions for judicial actors further strengthened by existing academic research. So tonight we have 11 recommendations that we're going to briefly outline and we organize them into three overarching themes, defining and promoting justice, making the most of pandemic specific opportunities for improvement and advocating for reform beyond the courtroom. And we could go into the next one. Thank you. So I'd like to start with talking briefly about procedural justice or procedural fairness and the way the judges we spoke to define this concept ties into all of the recommendations that we identified. So procedural fairness is different from the bare legal minimum of due process and it's sort of a deeper way of thinking about the legal or court process. The judges described that procedural fairness encapsulates things like building relationships based on kindness, respect and professionalism listening with an open mind, being mindful of one's own identity, and making the court process accessible for everyone. And while procedural justice may seem like an abstract concept, our conversations with the judges revealed very concrete ways that procedural justice can be institutionalized through courtroom policies. For example, Judge Teske eliminated plea bargaining in his courtroom so that youth do not feel pressured to plead guilty and he makes sure that they know they won't face a trial penalty if they want to go to trial. He also has a policy of not using restraints in his courtroom. And additionally, Judge Mendelson reminded us that everyone in the courthouse has a role in contributing to procedural justice. On this note, judges can train their staff from security guards to attorneys and everyone in between in accordance with the ideals of procedural justice and implement written or verbal exit surveys so that staff know how youth and families perceive their treatment, which helps foster accountability. And then we can go to the next one. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice. Okay, got it. So the next one is as judges implement procedural justice focused policies, it's critical that they consider the varying ways that those policies impact different populations and identities. As Judge Teske pointed out in relation to implementing evidence-based practices, it's kind of hard to hear somebody talking and teaching you a skill that would be useful if you're thinking more about whether you're gonna have dinner. This is especially urgent in the context of the coronavirus pandemic as Americans of color have, been, have by far borne the brunt of economic and health hardships. So with this, this in mind, judges can consider the ways specific practices and policies in the courtroom impact youth and families differently depending on their personal identities and experiences and push back against punitive one size all fits approaches. For example, in response to the pandemic, Judge Chesky began a home-based care package system to support youth and families who come into contact with his court. And then continuing with this theme of adaptation and flexibility, judges can use appropriate judicial discretion in order to foster procedural justice. The youth justice systems vary by state, legal precedent does exist for using uh, judicial discretion with regards to mitigating information and sentencing guidelines. And the instability and trauma that many youth and families have experienced before and throughout the pandemic highlights the relevance of considering mitigating circumstances. However, straying from sentencing guidelines may open the door to implicit bias, which many researchers acknowledge is related to racial disparities in sentencing. 
So as judges consider how to implement mitigating uh, circumstances and sentencing guidelines, they should do so with the awareness that implicit bias is deep rooted and that chipping away at it is a constant learning process. So while concrete legal and policy reform is crucial, Judge Mendelson and Judge Teske both emphasize the importance of building relationships based on trust and respect with youth and families. Judge Teske recommends taking youth and families as trustworthy messengers of their own situations, making sure that parents and guardians are consistently included and informed throughout the court process and verbally articulating to youth that they matter. Also creating relationships with community organizers and service providers is key so that judges can feel confident when they're referring youth to services that they're relevant, effective, and enriching. Um, and community organizations have played a really key role throughout the pandemic in keeping youth out of detention and meeting their needs, um, which amplifies the importance of building these relationships. Uh, furthermore, an interesting idea that emerged in our conversations uh, relates to relationship building again, and that's the role of physical space. So the design layout and other physical characteristics of a courtroom may impact the dynamics within it. Uh, for example, Judge Teske frequently leaves the bench to sit next to you so that they're at the same level and they can make eye contact. Now that so many proceedings are happening remotely, there's a new opportunity to consider the logic behind the way courtrooms are organized um, and the way power dynamics are organized within, within them. Um, additionally, remote court operations complicate the role of space. They may impede judges' ability to connect with youth and families, and those spatial hierarchies that ordinarily appear in courtrooms may not be as visible. It's possible that other factors may have a negative impact, um, like a messy Zoom background or mask wearing on implicit bias and fairness. And then the last recommendation for defining and promoting justice is to make time for reflection, growth, care, and healing. Judge Mendelson reminded us that judges too have experienced trauma as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and systemic racism. They can use these experiences to build empathy for youth and families. On this note, she recommends judges engage in endeavors relating to cultural awareness, anti-bias and anti-racist training, and other educational efforts. The current remote nature of these events means that they're more accessible than ever. And then shifting into the second category of uh, recommendations that we're sharing tonight, we have uh, pandemic specific opportunities for improvements. And as previously mentioned, both of these judges have long histories of engaging in system reform. Um, Judge Teske with the school-based restorative justice and Judge Mendelson with New York City's Close to Home Initiative and Raise the Age legislation. Uh, Judge Teske has noted in his comments to us, the pandemic made him realize that he could push more with regards to youth in detention. The minimal recidivism that's accompanied the massive reductions in youth detention as seen in the data he sees uh, in the past few months uh, is causing him to reassess his general in-out decision. So in-out being, do I detain this youth or do I not? Uh, and along these lines, Judge Mendelson also noted that we have the lightest touch of, of uh, our system on young people in my lifetime. Uh, specifically, there was a point in July that she noted where there were no juvenile delinquents, which is a, a New York State technical term, um, in secure detention in New York City which is amazing. Uh, these happenings likely wouldn't have taken place if not for the public health crisis. So we, must, we have to take this opportunity that's been given to us on this reflection to foster creativity and innovations. Uh, the second is technology and access to justice. So technology, as we're discussing this evening, uh, is full of positives and negatives. On the positive side, it provides greater access, uh, it improves convenience, youth and families don't need to attend in person to appear uh, for their court proceedings, which provides them additional time, uh, not missing work or school, not having to deal with transportation, but can also uh, provide some new biases or opportunities for inequity uh, for those who are less tech savvy, or people who don't, as Thomas uh, Dutcher earlier was talking about with the curated Zoom backgrounds and Samaria mentioned as well. Uh, if it's not as pristine, there are judgments that can come into play, bad internet connections. So what we need here is to think strategically about what court processes are appropriate to be done virtually 
even when it's perfectly safe and maintain that type of flexibility in our actions, even as we uh, progress out of the pandemic on the other side. The third uh, is to uh, move for strategic policy change. So our courts and legal systems rely on precedent. So judges have boundaries that they must operate within, but that doesn't preclude them from working smart with data that is available to them. These data that exist uh, and are measured uh, can help judges determine court cor course corrections that they can make to improve equitable outcomes and place a check on the biases everyone brings with them. It may be helpful or necessary to bring in external collaborators who are data experts, like researchers, uh, to interpret the data and move towards appropriate actions. Here we have a quote from Judge Mendelson talking about the importance of moving through this process slowly and building not necessarily consensus, but like understanding that it's really important that changes rely on precedent and create new precedent. And then our third category of recommendations that we're sharing this evening is advocating for reform beyond the courtroom. So the first is collaboration. Over and over again in our conversations, the judges emphasize the importance of working with other stakeholders from the youth and their families to other court staff, to police, to community program staff, and others. Judges occupy a unique position in the juvenile, in the justice system that grants them a certain neutrality and a level of deference. This means that they are really great at convening people and bringing people together into a space um, and Judge Mendelssohn quipped, uh, it's often said that when a judge calls a meeting, the entities appear, talking to this ability for judges to bring these disparate parties together to uh, further the conversation. So Judge Mendelssohn and Judge Teske have experience as members of groups, but also leaders of groups. So Judge Teske shared a pre-COVID story with us about a gathering he attended with people interested in beginning a school justice partnership. And he provided a couple pointers for establishing these sustainable uh, connections, collaborations. So he says, give it a name, give it leadership, that helps it be sustainable. And then our final recommendation is about education. So Judge Mendelson notes that she's grateful, uh, and I'll give you an opportunity to read this. Um, judges have roles both as educator and as students. They speak at conferences, write articles or blogs, participate in research. All of these activities can fit within the ethical frameworks judges work within. A piece of advice that uh, both judges had was to become familiar with one's local guidelines. Judges can also continue to learn from other judges, from academics, and from the youth and families they serve. With the pandemic, as Samari mentioned, many of the panels and presentations like tonight's are being recorded so they can be used as resources later. Judge Mendelson shared a practice of hers of keeping presentations she wants to see. Um, and this desire to become better informed is critical in the long-term process of reform. All right, so just to quickly conclude, this is of course an ever evolving conversation that will require all hands on deck to reimagine our youth justice systems as equitably as possible. In Judge Teske's own words, the bigger you are, the more burdens you have, the more responsibilities you have. Along with judges, researchers too can recognize the important role they can play in documenting and supporting positive reform efforts during the coronavirus pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I want to welcome all of our participants to stay a little bit, little bit late with us if you're able to do so, uh, so we can go through some questions. I do have questions for each of you. I want to start with Megan, um, partly because I warned you, you wouldn't get away with not talking, so it seems, it seems right to start with you. Um, I'm curious, though, if, if you have had any issues as you've gone through these videos with uh, video compression. Is that an issue with body-worn camera footage like it is with cell phone video footage? And what do you mean by video compression? Video compression with, um, well then it sounds like I'm setting you up for a, a difficult <laughs> question too. So um, uh, cell phone footage 
um, is, is broken apart by police departments investigating different videos because when you take a video, it's compressed for, to contain space on your phone. So if, if there are different slides where something is not happening, that slide gets, gets dropped. And so you've got a different kind of timeline than you would have in real life. And I'm wondering if that happens with the body worn camera footage as well, if you know, if you don't yeah. know. Dr. Making can correct me if I'm wrong, but we um, tend to get the in, the entirety of the interaction from start to finish. And as he mentioned, we have all different officers' perspectives as well. And so, yeah, we, we definitely get the entire interaction. Right, no wonder it takes you so long to go through all these. Yeah, there's and it's start to finish too, you can't miss anything in there, so. Great, thank you. Um, and David, I do wanna come to you, but before, I, I come to you, I just want to point out how cool it is to have so many students on this panel um, at the at WACJ Western Association of Criminal Justice for those who aren't for those who think WACJ sounds weird. Um, <laughs> we we love promoting student work. And if once we do get back to having our, our annual meeting, we always have a, a special competition for for student work. So keep an eye out for that, everybody. Um, Dr. Macon, I want to address the questions that came up in the chat that you can probably pull up and see also um, from Ellen. She said that mental health trainings versus actual application of trainings are usually delayed sometimes for years due to resistance by the professionals. Is this the case with law enforcement? And um, does your research have a racial or cultural difference? Oh, sorry, that question's for Thomas. Okay, don't answer that one. <laughs> I can answer aspects of it. Now, the, uh, I mean, part of what we're able to do is, you know, baseline interactions and look at training interventions. I mean, that's how we had you know, many agencies um, that really got on board is they were spending a tremendous amount of money in training and they wanted to know, was it changing behavior in the field? That's how um, my doctoral student last year, she was able to do that domestic violence study is that they had put their officers through trauma-informed interviewing um, and talking about victim-centric language and they want to know are they applying in field and so this was incredibly important to agencies and we all are very familiar with checking the box training and they wanted to move away from that if we're going to do it we need to ensure that there's efficacy in the training and if it's not being applied in field then we can start to think through why that may or may not be and so yeah, that's a big part of what we do. And the undergraduate students, uh, one of my academic bucket lists that I finally got to accomplish relatively early in my career is I wanted to publish with an undergrad student. And it was a project that came out of the lab. He, was, he assisted Megan last year. He's first author on it. He had this really cool idea. And so now it's under review. Uh, but that's, that's what this is all about, right? Like involving students in research. I, I really put it all on Megan because she's able to manage we typically have 20, 25 students in the lab annotating footage and then iterator reliability checks and it takes us forever to get through all of it. But at the end of the day, we think that it's a, a, you know, an important way to look at what's happening absent, very importantly absent researcher effects. Because no one, no officer knows that we're looking at their footage. There's no flag to let them know that we've looked at it. Um, and so for us, that's very important because we don't want to be there potentially influencing what they do. Great, thank you, and, and well done, Megan. Um, Thomas, I wanna come to you, just a clarifying point really quick. Did you say this is part of your dissertation research? Uh, I did not, it's part of an overarching uh, research study I'm working on currently. Uh, however, it incidentally is also related to my dissertation work. Uh, but that, again, I won't necessarily touch on that now, um, but it is still all related to this idea of uh, incarceration impacts uh, in the familial experience. Great, thank you. Um, so I did notice when you were discussing your participants, they it sounded like they were all heterosexual couples. So you were interviewing all men who all were married to women who were on the inside, is that correct? Uh, so I may have misspoken there. Uh, not all heterosexual couples. Um, however, all individuals who do identify as male, correct, yes. Thank you. Um, can you give us some more demographic information regarding um, socioeconomic status and racial and ethnic makeup? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Uh, so I would have to pull up the exact specifics, but if I remember right off the top of my head, split is uh, three white men, uh, two black men, one Hispanic male, uh, one who perf 
prefer not to disclose if that adds up to seven. Uh, sorry, it's almost 11 here. My brain is a little hectic at this point. Um, but yeah, so, and then socioeconomic status, same kind of general. There are two individuals uh, in the six figure range, um, others work in gig economy, um, others kind of in between the two. So yeah, kind of the whole uh, smattering there. None of these were um, purposefully targeted. Uh, men with incarcerated spouses is such a hidden population that it was more just about detailing out this experience uh, and any demographic, demographically based variables were incidental in a sense. Okay. Um, the way in which you're gathering your sample limits you to people who do have um, access to the internet. So it would be interesting if you were able to do any kind of snowball sampling to gather some people that you wouldn't be able to gather through online forums. But it, it sounds like with the, the range of incomes that you have represented right now, it'd be cool if you could ex expand that, which is, I know, easier said than done, especially during a global pandemic. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great suggestion. And that's actually the closing question in all of the interviews. Um, part of it, again, is that most of these men, if they have any contact with other individuals, it's through these message boards, um, or they don't know anyone. Um, but yeah, no, it's a great suggestion uh, in general. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Alicia and Samari, I want to come to you now. I'm, I, again, I commend you for your work. Uh, Samario, Samaria, you said you're a high school student, right? No, I'm an undergraduate senior in college right now. <laughs> My I'm a high school senior, and, and I was even more impressed than I <laughs> Thank you. Well done, all of you. I wondered uh, with Alicia and Samaria, do you plan on, on building on this, expanding beyond the, the two judges and beyond New York City in particular? Yeah, so we had uh, both New York City as well as Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, and Judge Mendelson is a judge throughout, or not a judge throughout the state, but she is a policy judge. So she informs on issues across the state. So it isn't just specifically New York City, but that's where she was a family court judge for a period of time. Uh, so the connection there. Um, we've talked a little bit about expanding this um, when we were brainstorming ideas. The idea for this research project came out of, we're both um, affiliated with the Youth Justice Institute at, in New York State at UAlbany. Um, and we had a panel back in June where we started this conversation asking about what is the pandemic currently impacting you? What do you expect it's going to do? And long term, like, what are these implications? So this is a, a continuation of that conversation, specifically looking at the judicial uh, system. So it would be really cool to continue this research and continue checking in every six months, seeing what reforms stick, and then eventually evaluating the efficacy of those um, as time goes on. And I think Judge Teske actually had one statement that was like, as awful as this is, like the length of the pandemic gives us data to inform um, what we're doing and if it's working. That's right. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I like your idea of seeing what sticks because you have identified one of the very few silver linings of this, and it's that there are fewer kids being incarcerated during this time. So um, we can that's all the questions that I have for you. I want to thank you all for your presentations. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we did record this, so hopefully we'll be able to get this posted up and shared with everyone. And uh, just thank you for the great work you're doing. Everyone have a good night.